when the people of the after colony era began moving into space, it was discovered that life inside of these colonies was much harsher than expected. One of these issues were reproductive abnormalities resulting in legislation requiring all babies to be born through in vitro fertilization, better known as test tube babies. These reproductive problems would be gradually overcome, and by the early AC100s, the first generation free from them could be born naturally. Unfortunately, this was not true for the Winner family, a wealthy industrial family that had been heavily invested into the drive to space from the beginning. Well into the AC-170s, they would still have to rely on in vitro fertilization as their only means of childbirth. But in AC-180, Katrin Winner decided that she would bear at least one of her husband's children. Fully aware of the consequences, she had decided to go through with the pregnancy that would inevitably be her last. Shortly after Katra Rabarbo Winner was born, she would pass away, leaving her husband to grieve over the strongest and most noble woman he'd ever met. However, for much of his life, Katra would go on to think that he was a test tube baby just like his 29 sisters. After Colony 193, a thoroughly annoyed Katra is on a shuttle to Earth, complaining about how boring the planet was and how it wasn't anything more than a cluster of mold. He then lamented that, as much of a cluster of mold it was, it still was better than him. But regardless of this, Katra wouldn't be bored for much longer. At least, one would think he wouldn't be as suddenly they were surrounded by unknown vessels. They identified themselves as the Mogwana Corps and the manet that they accompanied them to the resource satellite MO3 to be used as hostages. The employees on board of the shuttle turned towards Katra and asked them what to do. But Katra simply shrugged them off and told them to figure it out themselves. He was going to take a nap and they could wake him up when they arrived at MO3. The employees couldn't figure out whether to be amazed at the fact that he could just take a nap at a time like this, or to be offended at the complete lack of care what happened to them, or even himself. Anyways, the reason the Mogwana Corps wanted to go to MO3 was because it had been officially established by the Earth Alliance as a mining operation under the Winter Corporation, but in actuality, it was being run as a prison camp for political prisoners and other undesirables. The Mogwinog's goal then was to rescue these people and reunite them with their families on Earth. Katra then would serve as insurance so that they could safely make their getaway. But as they were telling him about their plans, he told them he wasn't so sure about his worth as a hostage. He told them that nobody cared about him and that his father could easily replace him with another one of his test tube babies. Unbeknownst to Katra though, his capture would appear to be mostly symbolic. Katra's father, Zaid Winner, seemed to have very little reservations about going along with the plans of the Mogwana Corps and even offered them their assistance in holding back the Alliance until they'd made their escape insinuating that the Winner family was simply dragged into this prisoner camp business by the Alliance. The Mogwinox, for their part, were also quite cordial with Zaid, and Rashid, the Mogwinox leader, had no qualms about him speaking to his son. The conversation that followed then was significantly less pleasant, with Zaid demanding to know what the hell Katra was doing there. To which a defiant Katra simply asked if his father was surprised to see that his tool was now acting on its own. After all, in Katra's eyes, he and his sisters were simply created by his father for the convenience of the Winner family, and Katra was now going to show his father that they could and would think and act for themselves. Of course, his father wanted to counter this, but it was Rashid's arguments that would have the most impact on him. 
figuratively because he told Catra that he too was a test baby and that he should have some pride in himself. And literally because he slapped some sense into him. After this, the Magwana Corps went to work and Catra was left momentarily in the care of Dr. J, who told them more about the Magwanogs, their goals, and even the origin of their name. It meant family and he thought that it was an allusion to the fact that they were kinder and purer of heart than anyone else, just like he felt Catra was. Catra fell silent and Dr. J went on to join the other workers of the mining satellite to escape with the Mogwinok, but not before telling Catra that maybe they would meet again in the future. At the same time though, one of the Mogwinok members had been secretly in contact with the Alliance for the entire time and had sold out his family. They were now rapidly approaching the satellite and warned the Mogwinok terrorists that their only option was to immediately surrender. They were under orders to indiscriminately attack them and to even disregard any hostages they might have. Unaware of the traitor, the Magwinox were thrown into a state of panic until Rashid told them to get it together and prepare for combat. It was also at this moment that Catra managed to capture the traitor and led him back to the rest of the Magwinox. But while they were deciding what to do with him, he managed to wriggle himself loose, grabbed Aouda's gun, and fired at Rashid. He would have dealt a fatal blow had it not been for Katra pushing him out of the way at the last moment, giving Aouda enough time to grab another gun and take out the traitor. Despite this, Rashid was still severely wounded and no longer able to pilot his commander type Mogwinok. Katra then also didn't escape unharmed and had taken a bullet to the shoulder. The other Mogwinok members then hurried to give them first aid, but the Alliance troops were now quickly closing in and with no time left, they had to launch. Their scanners indicated that there were over a hundred Leos and they had just lost their commander. The fight would be quite difficult. And feeling partially responsible for the situation, Katra offered to help. Obviously, the Mogwinox didn't want to accept the help of this random kid, but Katra wanted to fight. He wanted to be useful. And perhaps most importantly, he wanted to become a proud part of their family. Hearing this, the Mogwinox acquiesced. Katra would lead them into battle, and Rashid even told Aouda to give him his commander goggles. And so Katra fought, amazing all of the Mogwinox core with how well he was able to handle himself despite his wounded shoulder. With the last shuttle launching, Katra told the Mogwinox he'd covered their retreat to Earth. And even though there were still over 20 Leos left, Katra felt that it was what he needed to do to protect and to be accepted by his new family. Rashid and the others had no other option. They accepted and Rashid personally invited Katra to meet them once more on Earth. A promise that would be fulfilled two years later during Operation Meteor. And it was in honor of that faithful encounter where Katra ensured the safe return of all 39 Mogwinax to Earth that they would now start calling him Master Katra. And that was all for Katra's backstory. Out of all of the Episode 0 backstories, I unfortunately felt that this one was the weakest of the bunch. The first thing that struck me was just how out of character he felt compared to the Katra that we saw in the anime. Sure, he seemed to be going through quite a rough puberty with the whole test tube baby thing, but the way his entire character does a 180 feels quite forced to say the least. It kind of felt to me like the mangaka had a story they wanted to tell and simply felt that Katra was the least unfit for it and then they just kind of made it work with what they had. But I guess this just goes to show that there's nothing that can be fixed with a good bright slap. Or in this case, a Rashid slap. 
Also, as for Catra's thinking that his father doesn't care about him, he is kidnapped by a terrorist organization that has access to mobile suits, and the first thing he asks is, what are you doing there? Like, gee, I don't know. They maybe kinda force me to come here and, you know, by the way, I'm unharmed. Thanks for asking. Not that Catra's answer was any better though. Like, surprised to see your tool acting on his own? Dude, you didn't do anything. You were dragged along and at the one moment in the story, people actively asked you to do something, you went to sleep. Sure, the manga alludes that this could have been Catra trying to run away to Earth, a little bit, most likely due to plot convenient reasons. It's also very convenient that Catra not just knows how to pilot a mobile suit for no reason, keep in mind this takes place before his involvement with Operation Meteor, but he's also able to outperform seasoned veterans with a wounded arm. But hey, at the very least, we got to see how he got his signature goggles. Anyways, as I always say with these manga stories, make of these what you will. Personally, I see it as a greatly exaggerated version of the events that actually happened. Katra was being a troubled teen, just not to the extent shown in the manga, and his encounter with the Magwanox then kinda straightened him out a little bit. The spy thing and him saving Rashid from it does sound about right, although him then piloting the Magwanox mobile suits was again greatly exaggerated with a kernel of truth in there. As an inexperienced teen being able to pilot a mobile suit and then even taking out some Leos with a wounded arm should have been more than enough to earn him the respect of the Mogwinox. So as always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters. I hope everyone watching has a great day and I'll see you all next time.